Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the first para training of the 2021-2022 school year. Um, I'm joined with Heidi Rethmeyer here for Math Mindset. Good morning. So I'm Steph Lundgren. Oh, I'm sorry. Good Heidi, go ahead. Go ahead. I just say good morning or good afternoon, depending on when you're watching this. <laughs> and yep, I'm Steph Lundgren from the ESU 8 PD department. Um, you probably know me if you're tuning into a pair of training, but for all of those of you who are new, um, thank you so much for joining in today. Here are our emails. If you have any questions about today's presentation, please um, reach out. All right, math mindset. Um, Steph asked me to present a little bit on this because I'm doing some workshops this fall. And just to kind of give you some background, um, Periodically, we, re, we rewrite the standards, and this year we are rewriting the math standards. And there has been a shift in the last few years on really all the standards about how we approach the teaching and learning and what happens in the classroom. And so with that, uh, we're doing the same thing with math. So here's what I want you just to do is just think for a minute about your childhood math class and think about what things do you remember? What sort of feelings does it bring back? Matt, um, Steph, do you have any to share about your childhood math class? Um, lots of drill and practice, um, lots of worksheets. Um, time tests used to really rattle me. Um, I thought, I, I knew my math facts, but when you put the time in it, I got really nervous about that. Yeah. I remember two things very distinctly. One was um, a time test for multiplication. And the other one was, it was probably second grade. I don't know. We were maybe even first grade. We were learning subtraction and we, we were learning how to, a term they called borrow, which I don't like the term borrow. And I failed the entire, I did every single one wrong. <laughs> And it just caused so much anxiety for me. So go ahead and hit the next. So, so yeah, and the next one. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I want, did it make you feel anxious? I think you heard me and Steph talk about some of the anxious feelings that, that we felt when we think about our math class. And I don't remember a whole lot of, you know, being really curious and, and wondering about things. Next one. Because <laughs> it seemed like it was very much focused on speed and time tests and not so much about being creative with our problem solving. So um, those are some of the things that we're really trying to change um, in terms of what math class is all about and the feelings that, that maybe students have and that adults that we still have about math class. So next slide. So I'm gonna talk about several different mindsets that um, we're trying to really promote that I think as a para, you could really help enforce in a classroom. And one is just messaging. What kind of messaging is happening in the classroom? You know, are there any messages at all given to students about how they're thinking? Um, or are they very generic? Or are you really saying, you know, when a kid is struggling, you say, hey, I know you can do this. Your, your brain is working hard. This is how you grow. Um, so we want to hear some of that messaging happening in math class. Um, Steph, any thoughts on any of those? Um, I think, yeah, always um, reminding kids that, um, you know, that, that, the struggle is where the learning occurs. And so the more that um, we can help calm them down, we've talked about some calming techniques with Paris over the um, past few years, um, calm them down, make them think in a different way. Um, maybe they need a short break because they've reached that overload level. Um, or maybe they need to do some of the breathing exercises we've talked about just for a few minutes and then get back into it. Um, and we can help them through it rather than just take away any of that, um, you know, like giving them an escape hatch. We don't want to escape. 
we want to keep persevering through. Yeah, great. Thanks. And we'll talk about all of those things and some of these mindset messages that we talk about. And I appreciate the that, um, you know, as paras working alongside those students, you can really help them with, um, you know, taking a deep breath, um, maybe thinking about a different approach to a problem. Um, yeah, and then the second math mindset is praising the learning process. You know, um, oftentimes again, uh, math class often seems like it's just, there's one right answer and you just need to get it and you need to get it done. <laughs> and we wanna focus more on the process as opposed to just the product. You know, are we praising them about their effort and the different steps that they tried and the different strategies that they tried? So when you do see a kid maybe getting stuck, you can praise them for, hey, I, I, I like that strategy you tried. Is, or can you explain that strategy to me? Is there another way that you could think about it? Um, you know, we're not asking you to have the answers here. Um, I even tell the teachers that it's okay if we don't even necessarily know the answers or if we have a question that there is no one right answer, but can we help them think through the process? All right, next slide. All right, now students mindsets. Um, this is kind of like, what, what is the student self-talk? How are they talking to themselves about math class? You know, do you hear them say, well, um, my mom wasn't a math person, so I'm not a math person. I know I get parents that say this a lot as well. And so we're really trying to change that. Um, you know, and so is there, do, do kids express doubt in, in themselves and their abilities? Or do they have confidence and say, you know, I know this is hard, but I can do this. I can, I can learn math. Um, and maybe they're not good at something yet. I love the power of yet. You know, when they say that I don't know how to do it, you can say yet. <laughs> That's how we grow and learn. That has to do with some of the praising the learning process as well. So I think, again, as a parent, you can help them with their self-talk. And you can help you with your own self-talk. <laughs> I know I've had to change some things even at home um, about my self-talk and, and hearing some of my kids. So Steph, did you have a thought on that one? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I've heard the phrase before that um, adults words or adults um, talk becomes the inner voice for kids. And so when we talk about parents who have said things like, oh, our family's just not good at math um, or something like that. Um, we can start to change that in them and we can ask them to repeat some good thoughts. So if you hear a kid say something like that, say, say, oh, can I help you with that thought? Could you say, um, you know, um, math gives me struggles, but I persevere or, you know, you give them that little, um, that, that word, that mantra that they can repeat that will help them think better thoughts. And then you know, after they've gone through a struggle and maybe succeeded, you know, with a task or whatever, remind them of that success so that they can draw on that again and say, look at what you did. I want you to go home and tell um, what a good job you did today in math and how you worked through this problem so well. Yeah, great. Yeah, messaging is very important, both the messaging we're giving to the students as well as the, the inner talk that they have. So, all right, next slide. And I think this is my funny one. Um, mm. This comes from a very prominent math person um, nationally. She's, I think she's in Stanford. You know, this is not how it works. <laughs> um, you know, she's from England and I, they use maths like plural. So it always sounds funny to me. It's almost like a tongue twister to say it, but yeah, kids aren't born with a math brain or no math brain. That's just not it. I think we've conditioned them with historically how we've taught math that it, if you're not fast, you're not good. And we wanna get away from that messaging of fast means you're good. And I was really good at the math game in school. I was fast, I could do the worksheets, but did I have really deep conceptual understanding? Probably not as well as I should. And that's what we wanna focus on, so. And I think right. another thing in this picture that I see is that the boy, the baby boy might be good at math ah. and the girls aren't. And I think that that's an old time um, misconception and stuff too, that 
Um, yeah. You know, girls are good at with the communication and boys with math. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, mistakes. This is another great mindset that you could help with in the classroom. Um, and I think I mentioned this is uh, oftentimes we're just worried about getting the one right answer and um, mistakes are bad um, and we should avoid that at all costs. Whereas, you know, school is where we're supposed to make these mistakes and, and learn from the process. So we should explore those mistakes. So if you see a kid making a mistake, um, you could ask them, can't, you know, can you explain to me what you did wrong there, why that one was wrong and what you learned from that? Um, we want them to be comfortable in sharing their mistakes and what they learned from them. So, you know, um, feel free to have asked some questions about what they learned from that particular process. You know, Heidi, um, I've seen in the past even video clips of teachers saying, oh, you need to go fix this part on this problem. And the teachers almost tell the kids um, what's wrong and how they should fix it. Is it good for students to have to figure out how to fix it on their own sometimes? Yeah, I think that would be great and even better. And this is something else we're trying to promote in the classroom is to collaborate with a peer. It would be great if you if the student could partner up with someone and see how they did it. And then they can compare their steps, compare their strategies and maybe then they will find where their mistake was and have a better understanding. Um, you know, so that's that fine balance, which we'll talk about in a second about productive struggle. We don't want them to shut down, <laughs> um, but I think they can get a lot of help from their peers and looking at how someone else did it and then reflecting on how they did it. So um, I would encourage um, teachers and as a para to do that as well. So great point. All right, so here's our struggle and persistence, as Steph has mentioned um, a couple times now. Um, again, I think this is something we've kind of conditioned kids for if they get stuck to just go straight to the teacher. Um, you know, do they ask a, um, a classmate? Um, do they go to their textbook? Do they look for other resources? Um, or are they just shutting down? Um, so we wanna celebrate um, that productive struggle and again, use some positive messaging that you know this is how your brain is growing um, and you're learning through this process. And if they do get stuck, again, that's where we can say, okay, let's maybe draw a picture or let's try another strategy. Um, I think drawing, especially when you have kids maybe working with word problems, have them draw a picture, have them try to visualize it. Um, math is a very visual um, a subject, but we've kind of gotten away from that. So I would encourage more kids to draw, even high school kids, draw a picture. <laughs> I know I told my junior high and high school kids that all the time, draw a picture of what's happening. So um, to help them persist through a problem. And I don't know, Steph, have you talked about kind of a little productive struggle in the learning pit with, with some of your parents? I don't think we have, but I love these pictures. We were just talking about drawing a picture, right? That yeah. helps um, us understand it better. Yeah, so I found two pictures of the learning pit. So, um, you know, there's a learning path on the left and then you're introduced with a new topic and then you kind of get down in this pit where you really have to struggle and dig out of. Um, and then you come out the other side with some new learning. Now, um, as teachers and just adults, we like to try to build a bridge <laughs> and we can't build that bridge. Um, the kids have to really struggle for them to learn. All right, so I found these two particular graphics of the learning pit um, because I think the messaging is a little different on the way down into the pit. So if you look at the one on the left, it's, it's kind of a negative self-talk of the student of, I don't understand, it's too hard, I just wanna quit. Whereas the one on the right has a little more positive messaging of, I don't understand this yet, <laughs> and this is challenging and I'm confused, but um, you know, I'm still willing to try. So I think that goes back to our um, messaging 
and student self-talk that we can really help them when they are struggling. So to help them. Yeah, I think kids have to get used to that feeling of struggle, right? And we as teachers have to get more comfortable with seeing a kid struggle. Um, And I think, you know, when we hear a kid saying, it's too hard, I don't get it. Um, we feel like we have to swoop in and save the day. And our theme this year is superhero Paris. And <laughs> right. yes, you do swoop in and save the day. But um, unless we let them struggle a little bit and learn to get over that, um, we're going to have too many, um, too many times we have to swoop in and save the day, right? <laughs> we can't teach them to um, work on their own and start to learn on their own. Yeah, and that swooping in might be teaching them coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, what do we do when we're, um, you know, frustrated? Maybe take a deep breath. Uh, maybe take a lap around the room, um, and then maybe come back and try a different strategy. So, um, this last slide, I just wanted to give you some phrases, some some things to say when you know uh, you encounter a kid that's you know, maybe having a, you know, addressing a, a, a word problem that they're really struggling with. So, um, you know, some creative problem solving. So you might say, well, what's another way to think about this problem? Or how could we draw a picture? Um, you know, when they make a mistake, um, what kind of self-talk is happening in the kiddo? You know, is there shaming? Are they saying, oh, I was so stupid? Or are they saying, oh, I can learn from this? Um, you know, and asking them, well, what can you learn from this mistake and, you know, turn it into um, a, a learning opportunity. Um, I think, oh, go oh, ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm seeing carryover in these questions to other areas too, just not math. So, yeah, oh, absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. As I mentioned, um, I think we're seeing a, seeing a real shift in what our state is trying to do um, with our content areas. So, yeah. Um, And then communicating ideas. Hopefully the kids are talking about math in the classroom and they have a chance to collaborate. You know, I said, you know, hopefully they can partner up and compare what they did. And, um, or maybe a kiddo is struggling with something or you just see them, they did a problem and you're like, hey, will you just explain how you did that? (laughs) See if they can explain it to you so it makes sense to you. Um, And I really hope that we instill some more curiosity in the kiddos and that math isn't always just one right answer. Math can be very visual and open-ended. So, you know, when a kiddo is first encountering a problem, here are my two go-to questions. What do you notice? What do you wonder? (laughs) You can use those all the time. (laughs) What do you notice? What do you wonder? And then ultimately we want deep understanding. We don't want it to just be about speed and the kid playing the game, but do they really understand what they're doing? Can they show you why something works? Can they make a model? Can they draw a picture? So I think those are all great questions that you can put in your back pocket um, when you're working with the kiddos um, in math. So any other thoughts there, Steph? Um, No, I just, I see such carryover again. So I think, um, you know, think about how you can use these questions all through the day um, to really ask kids, um, you know, about their thinking. The more we can think about our thinking and um, think about, you know, what, why does, why do I struggle at that part? Um, You know, what, what gets me hung up there, then that informs what we need to learn. And then students can um, think, think more about that and and try to learn um, ways to cope through. You bet. Well, Heidi. Yeah, so that's all I had. And um, I sure appreciate the opportunity um, to talk to the Paris. So thank you for this. Thanks, Heidi. We appreciate you. And again, Heidi's email is at the beginning of this um, presentation. So if you need anything, please reach out. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh Bye-bye. Bye. Um, Another thing that we're going to focus on each month is the power of positivity. So I heard from many of you that um, that that's something you'd like to work on each month. So again, we're going to shine on and how can we focus on positivity? Well, there is a phrase called practical optimism, which combines the commitment to plan and execute the steps 
needed to achieve one's goals with a positive outlook that success is possible. So when we have practical optimism at school, it doesn't mean that we see all things as rosy and all things as perfect, but that we are really practical about that. And um, we're going to help achieve our goals with this um, good outlook. And so we need to stay focused on the upside, right? Um, and um, the more we do that, the better. Um, we practiced this in August when we had our training and we played a game called flip that thought, right? We turned it from negative to positive. And um, I like this meme that says, if you can't turn that frown upside down, sideways is an okay start. So we start to gradually get more positive in our day. So focus on the positives. And um, express gratitude. Um, and this is the time of year we, we do a little bit more of that. Um, when we can infuse that throughout our year is when we see the positive effects. Actually, expressing your gratitude um, lessens feelings of social isolation. It actually increases joy and optimism. It enhances acting with more generosity and compassion and actually improves your physical health. Um, they've seen um, that happen with blood pressure lowering and things like that, where your physical health goes up as well. So we practice our gratitude. Some people keep a gratitude journal. Um, I tend to lay in bed at night and run through all the things that I'm thankful for. And it can be really minuscule little things, um, but it really helps me focus on um, positive, good things in my life. And then um, you can um, commit small acts of kindness, right? Um, so one um, phrase that we use is random acts of kindness, where we don't even attach our name to it. People don't know where it comes from. Um, there's a random act of, um, acts of kindness website that's good. Um, but just simple little things like post positive um, uh, notes around your community. Can you imagine around your school just leaving a few um, sticky notes here and there that have something positive um, on them? One time my third grade class actually made smiley faces and we went up and put them all over the high school kids' lockers um, just as a random act of kindness. Um, Another simple one um, is to give compliments to the people you interact with, to the kids that you're around, to the other paras. Remember, we need to be each other's cheerleaders. Um, you know, leave, leave a little bit of change in the vending machine so that somebody can help themselves to a, a treat. Collect some, lit, some litter outside that you see. Um, make a meal for somebody who's in need. That's what I do a lot. Um, you could send letters with stickers to the kids in your life. Okay, so then you ask yourself, how does it make you feel? Um, so it's not enough that we just do these acts, but also for our own health, how did that make you feel to do something kind for others? Um, and that's where we see that um, gain for ourselves. And then we have to be mindful of our emotional state. So I love this little meme over here. And um, I often talk about squashing those bad thoughts, right? And so anything that comes up, we're going to bat it out, right? Just like this kitten is doing. Um, there's a nice article here about how um, being really mindful. And we were just talked about mindfulness with, with Heidi, right? And that mindset. Um, but we can be really mindful about our thoughts and how that actually improves our brain health, that um, we can change our brain and change the function of our brain um, by having these positive thoughts. So it's kind of encouraging, I think. And then you can give your brain and your body a positive workout. So you want to... Um, um, boost those endorphins and it just makes you feel so much better. I know sometimes if I catch myself in a bad mood, a nice brisk walk can really change things. Um, sometimes even just getting outside in nature will help that. 
So like when you get in a funk, you have to think about what, what are your ways to get out of that? And so anyway, physical exercise can help a lot. And then we can infuse positivity into our surroundings. So whether that's having a nice organized workspace, um, I think about it too, about if my house is a mess, I feel a little on edge, right? I like um, a cleaner environment, things um, picked up, put away. It puts me in a better mood. But when we think about our surroundings also, we have to think about the people in our surroundings. So you carefully consider who you interact with. Um, and, you know, if, um, if lunchtime is full of gossip, um, Maybe that's something you avoid. Um, if certain people turn to the negative, maybe those are people you avoid. Um, but then also we want to positively affect our environment, right? So we have to think about what am I saying and doing in my environment? Am I uh, making that a toxic area for others? Or am I helping spread you know, that sunshine and light around that we'd like to do? So again, always reflecting on how do you feel? Good vibes in, good vibes out. And it's a really deliberate effort. We have to decide to be happy every day. We have to decide on um, good thoughts and good feelings and staying positive. So I hope you tune in um, throughout the year. Um, you can tune in next time. Same bat time, same bat channel, right? We'll be here in December, um, the first Tuesday at 2 p.m. We, of course, always record our Zooms. And we're going to talk more about adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. Uh, you asked to hear more about those after Sonia Suckup's talk in August. So we're so glad to have you with us. You Paris truly are superheroes. Um, thank you so much, and we'll catch you soon.